A very good evening and a warm welcome to our second edition of UBC News Tonight on this 18th day of April 2024. I'm Lorene Masika Kazimoto. Now before we delve into tonight's news bulletin, let's first take a look at the top stories tonight. And in our top stories tonight, Finance Minister Kasaija promises solution if traders meet the president. 1,903 handed certificates of customary ownership in Amulata. Speaker Among tasks each Ugandan to plant five trees in honor of Dr. Tom Okrut. And in sports, Victoria Pearls return to the qualifiers for the second time for a slot in the ICC T20 Women's World Cup. Good evening once again. I'm Lorreen Masika Kazimoto. Now, President Yuri Kaguta Museveni has tasked Ugandans to prioritize on issues that force. The judiciary has been struggling to have a home for the appellant courts, the Supreme Court, and Court of Appeal in 1999. The idea of constructing these courts was unveiled. However, it remained shelved until 2014, when it was approved by the judiciary top management, and the construction kicked off in 2019. Four years later, the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal buildings have today been commissioned with an aim of bringing services closer to the people. As the Permanent Secretary for Judiciary, Pras Bijirimana, explains. A big statement to confirm that after all, government can deliver, especially when the players have got their what I call abundance mentality, coupled with patriotism. And all the funding has been from the government of Uganda. President Jerry Hakuta Museven commissioned these buildings at the Judiciary Headquarters in Kampala, where officials from the Executive, Judiciary, and the Parliament plus Development Partners we are in attendance. Yeah. Museven commended the judiciary on this milestone, attributing it to patience and planning by the NRM government. The ones who saw and mobilized all the rest of us. So I salute the CJs who are there, the Wambuzi, my schoolmate uh, Odoki. Now, I want to thank the judiciary again for what the CJ has, uh, has correctly called original justice. President Museven further urged Ugandans to prioritize on matters that ensure validation for the betterment of the country. The commissioning of this building again confirmed that there is nothing we cannot do if we prioritize. The, at one time, the World Bank and the European Union didn't want to give us money for the roads. I don't know why. You know, they are usually running up and down. So I told my people, forget about these people. The Banyankore say, Etajujirinyoko, Kobo Nechirinyotunari. A cow which is not your mother's bride price. Even if they give you a hoof, valid raw materials, but using knowledge to create products, like the automobiles, Chira motors, this is not just adding value. It is producing something out of so many elements using the brain. On his part, the Chief Justice Alfonso Winyudolo said these buildings will save the judiciary 6 billion shillings annually. The construction of these two buildings, the Twin Towers, comes 85 years after the construction of the High Court building as the headquarters of the judiciary in 1930, creating courts in rented premises compromises the security of the courts. Second, the courts would operate in premises designed as business arcades or residential apartments. The Deputy Chief Justice Richard Butera 
on behalf of all justices and support staff, said they are glad to have a home with no interruptions during work. Never be proud of our team towards. The judiciary's efforts are now geared towards infra uh, transformation agenda and the construction of such buildings will change our trajectory for good since our good work, uh, physical environment and staff activities will be, bro will be enhanced and staff morale will be high. During the function, various people who saw the success of the completion of these courts were awarded, including Emeritus Justice Benjamin Odoki, Bart Katrebe, Judicial Permanent Secretary Paris Bijirimana, Chief Justice Owenyi Doro, Ingenia Abal, among others, Rebecca Nantongo, Susan Inabugude, UBC News. Now all is set at Chitebi Senior Secondary School in Lubaga Division ahead of President Yuri Kaguta Museveni's visit scheduled for tomorrow, the 19th of April, 2024, where he is expected to launch the National Patriotism Environmental Protection Campaign. We have more. <laughs> All roads will be heading to Kitebe Senior Secondary School in Rubaga Division, Friday 19th, April 2024. Here the President of Uganda, Yuri Kagutam Seven, will be the chief guest at the launch of the National Patriotism Environmental Protection Campaign. Where we are going to plant trees and also to look at our environment as a whole. We are aware that the environment has actually been abused. The environment is a very key factor in all our lives. At the school, students have been this Thursday afternoon conducting last time rehearsals ahead of the Friday event. US, this is a USE school, a universal secondary education school. But it is one of those success stories and it has a model patriotism club. So we wanted people to come to Chitebi and see that some of these projects can actually programs, government programs, like universal secondary education, can be a success. So in this school, we have over 4,000 students. We have, there is enough uh, infrastructure to assist all these students in their learning uh, capacities. That is why we chose Chitebi so that people can come and see what some of these programs can be like and how successful they can be. According to the program, the President and the First Lady are expected at the event by 11 a.m. And in this, we expect them to actually conduct, to plant the first trees as a sign of the launch of the tree planting session. And they will also be commissioning two buildings in this school, buildings that have been put up to help boost the infrastructure in the school. The intention of the flag off is, among others, to make these youth to be pastors of environmental protection. So the campaign has been geared by, uh, has been spearheaded by His Excellency Yori Kabuta Museveni to make sure that Ugandans are alert about the environment and the dire effects if we mismanage environment. By close of the day, security and other service providers have already taken positions at the school waiting for the D-Day. Roberto Nyango, UBC News. A high-level meeting held at State House in Tebe has paved the way for the establishment of the Kampala Marathon, a prestigious event with an investment of 4.6 million US dollars. The meeting, hosted by President Yuri Museveni, saw the participation of Dr. Am Ambassador Dr. Amina J. Mohammed, the former Cabinet Secretary for Sports, Heritage and Culture in Kenya, Bob Verbeck, the CEO and founder of the renowned sports marketing agency, Golazo, and Honorable Peter Ogwang, the State Minister of Education responsible for sports, and Odrek Rabogo, the Presidential Advisor, Special Duties, and Chairman of PASID Uganda. Now, during the meeting, President Museveni committed the Government of Uganda's support by approving funding for the Kampala Marathon.
The Minister for Finance, Matia Kasaija, has urged traders to remain calm, proposing that after the meeting, after meeting the President on Friday, Friday there is hope for funding a solution to the implementation issue of the EFRIS system. While meeting the combined committees of finance and trade, along with leadership from traders and the Ministry of Trade, Kasaja emphasized that issues like EFRIS system are matters of policy and will require legal processes. Committees of Finance and Trade have engaged Minister for Trade and Minister for Finance, Matia Kasaija, URA, and the leadership of traders' associations on the issue of the electronic fiscal receipting and invoicing system as mandated by Speaker of Parliament, Anit Anita Mong, when she referred the matters to these committees on 9th April. However, the meeting was suspended as members refused to proceed without the presence of Minister for Finance, Honor Matia Kasaija. Better that we even have the Minister of Finance. There is no taking a person from Minister of Finance. They are the ones to defend this matter on the floor. They uh, uh, plead that you, you suspend, even if it's for five minutes. You the committee members agreed to first allow representatives of the traders to present their petitions, but MPs guided to have all concerns represented at once. The leadership of the United Arcaders Traders Entrepreneurs Association suggested that URA take back the system for better packaging, while Casita proposed that the system be implemented from factories or entry points. Is the complaint that uh, URA is not using clear mechanisms to identify who should enroll on VAT. Traders were saying the system was unfair to most of the traders because uh, the criteria you are is using is not well defined. How can you tell me that you have come for sensitization with armed men? Even it is like a, it was like intimidating. The leadership of the Uganda Supermarkets Owners Association, who have interacted with the system, raised issues regarding application selection and skills, with the main concern being the penalty of six million if one fails to issue an e-receipt. For people who are on the system and, uh, and uh, for whatever reason they have been penalized, we can start on a fresh page but by waiving those penalties that have taken away the working capital. Police and so on somewhere around, they simply go away because they don't want to be part of that issue. So the end result is that supermarkets are losing customers. For most of you who have been following up supermarket trends, they are closing. The Commissioner General URA, John Musinguzi, informed the committee that this is an affordable and user-friendly system, although he acknowledged that data might constrain traders. On the issue of penalties, he stated that it is already in the law and cannot be altered. It was determined to be once a month, and this is what we are applying. Of course, even six million on penalty is not small money. The best way to avoid the penalty is once you go on IFRIS to issue e-receipts all the time. As URA, we are committing to intensify the engagement and sensitization. Maybe what Members of Parliament reacted to these petitions and URA's presentation with divergent views, some supporting the system as good, while others recommending its suspension temporarily. Most MPs stated that certain policies like the penalty are unfair to traders and need to be reviewed. Given the advantages you have given to do with the uh, IFRIS and this technology, why don't you give it some time so that people gradually adopt it rather than enforce it? This system needs to be suspended because people are not sensitized. And you are, you've not taken the initiative of orienting our traders about your system, and you want them to adopt the system. Let's also make sure that we deal with unreasonable penalties. Because the Tax Procedures Code, Section 73, the penalty we talked about of six million, the monkey came from the ministry, we, 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 we carried it as parliament, it's now a monkey. and now it is our monkey, and penalties seems to be harsh. Can we look at it? But you remember, it's a matter of the law. Traders raised concerns about the deployment of the military at their shops, who forcefully ask for e-receipts. But URA stated that 
This is to provide security to their officers. MPs had differing reactions to this, with some also raising concerns about larger players in the industry, especially supermarkets, evading taxes. If you do that, you just end up going to everyone. Now people's things are all taken. We are even scaring our buyers. They do not want to come there anymore. Others are now preferring to buy in upcountry. Security for our staff is non-negotiable. Because in some places, our staff of URA have been beaten. Minister Kasaija emphasized that some issues are policy-related and will require legal processes, but stressed that traders closing down shops significantly affects economic growth. So I wish to tell everybody here, I want this matter to be sorted out yesterday. But we have got procedures, we have got laws. That's why I'm praying that let us come down to that uh, tomorrow I am reliably informed that the president is coming, is going to meet these, the, the, the traders, the, the representatives. And I'm sure by the end of the, tomorrow we shall have known now the right direction. Two, we, two days, Minister Kaseja told us directly that he has nothing to solve within these few days. And his way, he needs two more weeks to solve these problems. And it's not our problem as leaders, but traders, they have pain. The errors have been discovered in. For a moment, it should be put on hold. That we as the community, the business community, cannot proceed with those errors in the system. Members of the committees will convene for an internal meeting to discuss the issues and produce a report to present before the House. I'm Navka Farida and Gloria Gwitabinji at Parliament. Stabilizing the once failed state of Somalia that had been taken over by Islamic fundamentalists of the Islamic court and uh, also later the Al-Shabaab, all financed by Al-Qaeda, required joint efforts of the African Union, the United Nations and the European Union. Now, all these international bodies have played a role in restoring sanity in Somalia from a failed state to now a manageable and governable state. Now, in our special edition tonight, our reporter Ivan Joko reports what it involved to stabilize Somalia despite all the small existing pockets and in insecurity in some areas outside Mogadishu. At the Artemis main camp base, we interacted with the Artemis Deputy Commissioner of Police, SCP Martin Amoru, and his team with whom they run the camp. SCP Martin Amoru attributed their success to a number of factors, ranging from deployments in Mogadishu and other federal member states, the regular patrols, community involvement in policing to avoid attacks and crime, as they also carry out training with the inclusion of women. The police, we, we do support in three main areas. Uh, one of them is the operational support. In operational support, we do patrols. We do patrols. Some of the patrols are on our own. Some patrols are joined uh, with the Somalia Police Force. Uh, we're also in operational support, we do, in case they are having operations, we help them cover the operations so that they do the operation together. We, we give the cover. Uh, also, women initiative. Uh, the other network, the one they, the one they call the Somalia Police Force Women Initiative, uh, that group helps uh, in uh, uh, gender issues. Then collocation between Artemis police women with the SPF police women, they, they collocate together. Then we have workshops and trainings. Artemis police training and development coordinator SCP Asiedu Okanta Samuel from Nigeria he says they have trained citizens in various courses about human rights. We are taking them through various investigative techniques and, uh, and investigative processes and procedures as well. And so the issue of Elizabeth handling chain of custody, all those we take them through. Case management, we take them through. Docket handling, how to have a case file 
and how to process your information. Meanwhile, in Al Jazeera 2, the command of the Uganda Formed Police Unit, which comprises of Uganda and Nigeria, also the contingent commander of Battalion 11 SSP Javent and Ewuku, shared with us their efforts of protecting Somali citizens. A mandatory prerequisite for the United Nations and African Union. We support them just like we have a role to mentor them, uh, we have a role to advise them, to do the right thing, we have a role to, to train them at times, basically to teach them what to do as we, as we do it back home, as required by, 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 the, by the mandate. SSP Ewuku is satisfied that they have instilled enough skills in the Somali police force and have already handed over responsibility to the Somali police although they still monitor their performance. Before, as I told you before, we, we handed over the responsibility to them. So they are the ones who take the lead and in this way uh, we support them just like we have a role to mentor them, uh, we have a role to advise them, to do the right thing. Much as the time of transition is still pending, the official handover to Somalia is scheduled for 24th December 2024. During their operations in Somalia, the duty Artemis military and police forces have focused on capacity building for the Somalis to take charge of their country's affairs. Um, even... You may find a police officer who is a Somali, but when it comes to relating, guiding, mentoring, it becomes hard, and that one becomes a challenge. So what helps us most to sail out of these issues, to sort out this problem, is the language assistance. The situation is, uh, like you've heard, it is uh, very, very unpredictable, and especially because of the violent extremism. It is our big problem here, especially the Al-Shabaab. Uh, so uh, it's, the, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge which affects even our work. In fact, the major one, everybody here, you ask about anything, they talk about uh, uh, Al-Shabaab. The Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Anita Annet Among, has tasked each Ugandan to plant at least five trees in honor of Dr. Tom Okrut. The former executive director, National Environment Authority, died on Sunday at Platinum Hospital, leaving an indelible mark on enforcement of environmental conservation regulations. This was all said of him during a requiem service at St. Luke Church of Uganda in Nintenda, where the gospel of unity was preached amongst the people of Teso. This is how overfield. St. Luke, Church of Uganda was in Intinda, a suburb of Kampala, the capital city of Uganda. The congregants were here to condole with the bereaved family of Dr. Tom Okurut, who died on Sunday at Platinum Hospital. To join the mourners was the Speaker of Parliament, Anita Among Anit, who recounted her first and subsequent encounters with the deceased. We all agree that Dr. Kurut, when he was in Nema, was very, very crucial in the regulation and enforcement against the threats to environment and conservation. Doctor would always tell us, please advise members of parliament to plant trees. Please advise members of parliament to conserve environment. In him, she saw an environmentalist whose legacy is worth protecting, hence the need to plant trees in his honor. How I wish each of us when we live here, we should say because we loved Tom, let's plant at least five trees for any member of Tom. <laughs> Tom is no more but he has left a legacy behind. The unity displayed at Dr. Okrut's funeral church service is the same that she wants to see even after he's buried. This would really develop. I wish we were so united like this. This would develop. This is an indicator that the foreign conservationists lived a meaningful life, a fact 
that the family is alive too. Papa was uh, very exemplary and he always challenged us to to achieve uh, to the best of our abilities. No matter what, no matter how many we were, we never lacked. He worked tirelessly. The widow to the deceased, Dr. Anna Rose Ademon, recounted her life with the deceased from their first days of dating to his death. So by the time I got my boyfriend, Tom Okuru, by then, he had just finished university and I was entering university in 1983. So that's how we met. So he became my boyfriend. Finally, he was my father because I had to take pocket money from him. To share condolences with the family was the Vice President Jessica Alupo. Her message was delivered by the Speaker of Parliament emphasizing unity. I send a heartfelt condolences to the family, friends, and everyone whose life was touched by the late in one way or the other. Everyone dies, but not everyone lives. So I think Dr. Tom, though short a life, has lived and created impactful living in society. The gospel of unity was embraced by all leaders, despite varying political affiliations. I also want to emphasize the fact that unity is paramount, patriotism and nationalism. I want to thank His Excellency, the President, and government as a whole, for having given them the opportunity to serve the country. And one shouldn't be surprised that there has been a huge turn-up of the Tesla community to pay homage to him. And this is going to be extended to uh, the burial place in Akadot in Ongoro in the district. Dr. Tom Okurut retired in July 2021 as the executive director of NEMA after serving two five-year terms. He will be laid to rest on Saturday. 20th April 2024 at his ancestral home in Akadot, Mukongoro in Kumi district. Henry Okrut, UBC. The Bishop-elect of Gulu Archdiocese, His Lordship Raphael Wokorach, has advised young leaders to exhibit integrity while executing their duties at work. During the pass-out of students of leadership management studies at Uganda Catholic Management Training Institute, Bishop Wokorach was concerned over the integrity issues among the youth. A total of 259 students were awarded certificates and diplomas in different leadership disciplines at the 16th graduation ceremony at the Uganda Catholic Management Training Institute. Some students were awarded with diplomas and certificates internally, while others received external awards from the Uganda Business and Technical Examination Board. UCMTI endeavors to address this gap by focusing on market-oriented programs with a practical hands-on approach. The principal Uganda Catholic Management Training Institute, Dr. Nasuna Musoke, tasked graduates to behold the world outside while exhibiting all skills and morals attained as leaders for their career development and life changes. Be prepared not only to learn new things, but also shed outdated information and relearn to stay relevant. While presiding over the graduation, Bishop-elect of Gulu Archdiocese, His Grace Raphael Pimon Wokraj challenged the young leaders to be prepared for the challenging world ahead and be oriented towards defeating all life challenges. Let nothing disorient you unnecessarily. The beauty of your life and the beauty of your profession will depend very much on how you embrace this awareness that you are called to live a knowledge, a kind of knowledge that will lead you to fulfill a goal. The principal Uganda Business and Technical Examination Board, Dr. Wilfred Nahamia, noted that Yobitab is now laying more emphasis on relevant skills rather than mere certificates. I'm not saying the certificates are not necessary, 
but the emphasis now is being put on the competencies so it is your competencies, it is your skills that should give you a job. He revealed that TBTM has also started a partnership with the Institute of Certified Public Accountants to allow all starting students undertake accounting technician diplomas for easy advancement. And from this year, the ISPA handed it over to us. We shall be starting the first assessment. Students were further warned against shortcuts to wealth. There is society pressure, there is peer pressure, uh, the opposite sex pressure, but I challenge you to define your values and stick with them. Their benefits are measured. Some of the graduates shared their experiences towards their excellence. What helped me to achieve that is that first I could read ahead of the teachers. Uganda Catholic Management Training Institute was established in 1969 by the Episcopal Conference as a training institute in response to professional needs. The institute offers business studies, technical and humanities in all professional grounds. Susan Naonga reporting for EBC TV. The Ministry of Ethics and Integrity from the Office of the President introduced a plan to identify and regulate the various faiths following the challenge of cults and conmen abusing their followers, a move the born-again leaders have rejected. They have asked the ministry to give them time to also contribute to the government's proposed bill. Last year, the government, through the Minister of Ethics and Integrity from the Office of the President, introduced a plan to regulate various faith. In this process, the government wants to promote transparency, unity, accountability and development in different faiths. Meanwhile, the agency has been consulting leaders of various denominations and they have met with pastors of born-again churches from various parts of the country. Alex Okello from the Minister of Ethics and Integrity said they are still receiving comments from stakeholders on the bill and the ministry will soon come up with a final decision. In the last two months we have been going round the country and uh, we had specifically actually identified a number of these leaders and we said we must sit with them, discuss with them at length before we can put a document for national validation. And this discussion today, I must say, it has been very good. During the meeting, Bonagain pastors slammed the plan, saying they were not consulted as leaders. Well, some of the contents, if implemented, would benefit them on evangelistic issues. We have had a good interaction with these people from ethics and integrity, and we have agreed that since the police say, if it is in a good heart and it is meant to, to help us as a church, we should be given enough time we read through and also uh, we write down what we think will be a good policy for the church. We are saying that this policy, there are some things that are good in the policy, but 80% uh, in that policy, those things cannot work. We understand that in this plan, government wants to set up a special commission to monitor the Lutheran churches, which pastors say could lead to wars and divisions as leaders fight for the economy. Now that board cannot manage the born again. They are born again, we are different umbrellas, different completely. And we have, say for example, if you elect a chairman who is a Muslim to govern the born again, the Muslims pray differently, the born again pray differently, they believe differently. There are those who don't believe in the Holy Spirit. For us, we believe in the Holy Spirit. At the meeting, the pastors asked the bill be set aside and give the time to analyze it and find out what is in their interest because they see its contents as contrary to the word of God. The Minister of Ethics, when we debated what they had on the table, they asked us, what do you want us to do? So they asked us to also write down our views, what we think should be in the policy. 
So we have gone and we are going to have our time to, to sit and write down what we think should be the policy to govern our religious organizations. They even wondered why the government did not first identify the traditional healers who have been seen cheating the people of Uganda, but focused on those who are preaching the word of God. Before they put a policy to the born again, but it's your policy about our witch doctors, about Tavana, about Yavana. Government is okay dealing in nature. The 2014 report of the Uganda Bureau of Statistics showed that Catholics are the majority in Uganda with 40 percent, Christians 32 percent, Muslims 14 percent, Lutherans 11 percent, Seventh Day are 1.7 percent. Ndoga Nicholas compiled this report. Minister Jim Muhwezi has encouraged residents in Kanungu district to participate in government programs aimed at creating wealth for all. He noted that the 10-point program of the NRM introduced after assuming power was designed to improve people's livelihoods. He addressed the residents of Kakenzi East in Kanungu district during the belated NRM celebration. As Ivan Kaha reports, the minister issued a warning to those who sabotage government programs. Residents of Kanungu district have celebrated the belated NRM day to commemorate the protracted struggle led by President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni. The event took place at Komboni Playground in Kambuga sub-county, Kinkizi East constituency, Kanungu district. The event highlighted the significance of the day with the presence of the ministers of security and ICT and national guidance who reiterated NRA's efforts to eliminate bad politics, poor governance and religious divisions. Once they remember the causes of the war and then avoid repeating the same mistakes, and then they know the new era which we brought, the ideology of NRM, then it will give meaning to the celebrations. And the, the question that hangs is, did they fight for the right cause? And the answer is yes, because Uganda has transformed, Kanungu has transformed, and more programs are coming. Minister Muhwezi urged the public to engage in wealth creation programs established by government and take advantage of the peace and security achieved by the NRM. For example, that we brought parish development model. Are they promoting it, making sure that people overcome poverty and engage in the commercial production? We have made progress, and that's why you see people happy, singing, <coughs> and recounting the many achievements which have been registered under NRM leadership. Peace, security, transformation, improvement of quality of life, people enjoying themselves, of course they still express. Minister Muhwezi warned against officials who hinder the government's efforts to provide free education to learners where UPE is being uh, abused and uh, actually undermined by teachers and parents putting their new charges when the government is paying money for a child to come in school and uh, get uh, education from teachers paid for by government. Government is building classrooms, uh, paying uh, salaries for teachers, giving them scholastic materials, but when they create charges, then they force people out of school. This is a mistake. Overall, the security minister assured attendees that the country remains peaceful despite the presence of negative elements of terror. We are exporting security to other countries. We have more than enough, so we export some of it. but. On a serious note, the situation is okay. The UPDF, the police, the prisons, the security agencies 
are doing a good job. Dr. Chris Wariomunsi donated textbooks to all government and private secondary schools in Kinkizi East to enhance students' learning experiences. We have 30 secondary schools in the constituency, both government and private, and all of them have received uh, textbooks from the office of the member of parliament because education is one of the programs that I do support as a member of parliament and we supplement the efforts of government to ensure that our children can get better education. Brian Tumwenebi Aruhanga, Ivan Kahwa, UBC News. The NRM National Treasurer, Ambassador Barbara Nekesa Oundo, has challenged local leaders to popularize government programs to the people and how they can benefit from them. Nekesa was representing the Prime Minister, Robina Nabanja, at the belated Women's Day celebrations for Wakiso District. As joy and relation for the women of Wakiso District as they marked belated women's the celebrations at Works Grounds in Entebbe. The commemoration of the International Women's Day envisages to create a world of equality and opportunities for women and achievements celebrated and rights upheld. Marked on the theme Accelerating Gender Equality Through Women Economic Empowerment, Wakiso Women's Day celebrations attracted many attendees, including women exhibitors. The NRM National Treasurer, Ambassador Barbara Nekesa Oundo, officiated the day's activities representing the Prime Minister Rubina Nabanja. Nekesa implored local leaders to sensitize the population about government programs and how they can benefit from them. For these people who are being mobilized, the intended beneficiaries, for them to first of all embrace the program. Two, to own the program. And three, to benefit from them. So to other this information about these government interventions is it is not personal to all. Give this information to the leaders who are working with you, the ones who have voted to move from village to village, let them carry this information, spread it as much as they can, so that we have people who can now understand what is there for them. Embrace it, own it, and benefit from it. The NRM Director for Mobilization, Rosemary Seninde, challenged the population to refrain from politicizing government programs, emphasizing that everyone is entitled to benefit from government arrangements. We have the PDM that every leader talks about. We have all those programs. But the question is, is everybody aware about these programs? Do they understand how they are supposed to get them? So we need to help and guide our people, and it is a responsibility of all of us. If we don't do that, then many of our women would stay behind. And yet we want every woman to achieve and benefit from the government programs and from the pillar, among the pillars of NRM, that is the social economic transformation. Seninde appealed to especially women to strive and get involved in income generating ventures. And this is one uh, thing that we must appreciate. It's among the things that we must appreciate His Excellency the President as his achievements because he, he emancipated women. When we talk about socio-economic transformation, when you look at all the programs that he has brought, 30% of those programs are going to women. When we look at the 30% that is going to the youth, women are involved. So we must appreciate His Excellency the President for all the programs that are helping our women to be emancipated. Uganda has over the years made tremendous strides in promoting women emancipation through affirmative action in politics, education and other sectors. The National Blood Bank, Nakasero, requires over 70,000 blood units every month to address the needs of numerous individuals involved in accidents on a daily basis. In response, the National Blood Bank urges the public to donate blood, emphasizing the importance of saving the lives of many Ugandans. Additionally, medical facilities have been instructed not to sell blood to those in need.
Clinton Taiwa, the National Blood Bank recruiter, revealed this information during a blood donation exercise organized by Indians under the organization BAPS Charities. We need over 7,000 7, 7, units because like around Kampala only we have seven teams that collect blood. So each team is supposed to be giving at least a maximum of 1,000. So you can imagine it is supposed to be 7,000 people who are supposed to be donating blood to make sure that various hospitals, whether public or private, are having, are having enough units of blood. Thank you. Over 2,000 blood units were collected at the Sri Swaminarayan Temple in Kampala. We are calling upon all of you to come and uh, donate blood. Wherever you find us, you're always at uh, Min Price. Uh, in Kampala, we are everywhere. Kindly come and save a life. Ajay Kailash Singh, the country coordinator of BAPS Charity, highlighted their commitment to mobilizing members at the Shri Swaminarayan Temple to donate blood. This charity is a, a global charity organization which works across the nine countries and in very many countries around the world. This initiative aims to save lives, particularly of mothers in rural areas and individuals involved in accidents requiring blood transfusions. The BAPS charities have... Uh, Singh noted that since the inception of their blood donation efforts, over 10,000 units of blood have been donated as a means of giving back to the community. Been worked and is still in, in, in the field of uh, education, health, environment. Vairaj Panchal, a volunteer at BAPS Shri Swaminarayan Temple, mentioned their provision of special skills to youth with over 1,000 beneficiaries now equipped to establish their own projects, thereby improving their livelihoods. We have a building that, com that composes of various classes that helps in programs for the youth, for the ladies, for the elderly, in which we give them different different skills for example professional speaking presentation cooking car maintenance all various skills benon mukwaya richard chirembeka in kampala qbc news tonight takes a very short break but return with more stories Friendly Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO of Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source Osmosis. of the Nile. I don't have money today. <laughs> Just a couple of loan of 200 you get to stock my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The banker commander, not the banker tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're so tingy. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. The government of Uganda and the Uganda Bureau of Statistics is calling upon all stakeholders such as the chief administrative officers, city mayors, resident city commissioners, city clerks, city and division councillors, wards and LC chairpersons, as well as the residents and business communities to cooperate with the UBOS field teams as we embark on advanced preparations to conduct the National Population and Housing Census on the 10th of May 2024. The census will be at 10-day exercise to obtain statistical data and information that will be used for planning and policy formulation including information on 1. how many we are, 2. where we are, 3. how we are living, 4. what we own and 5. where we access services from. The Uganda Bureau of Statistics has now started listing of households and mapping in the 11 cities of Arua, Fort Porto, Gulu, Hoima, Jinja, Lira, Mbale, Masaka, Mbarara, Soroti, and in the Greater Kampala, comprising of Kampala, Wakiso, and Mukono districts. For more information, please call 0755 342 128 
or 0773-342-128. This message is brought to you by the Executive Director and Census Commissioner, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Census 2024. It matters to be counted. Katiyosumu <laughs> MTN Mobile Money Uganda Limited. Erunga Miswa Bank and Kuruya Uganda. Welcome back from that break. And now into the world of sports. I'll be a day after Uganda has launched its 100 days to the Olympics. That starts on Friday, July 26th in Paris. France. We have more details on this report. Half of the government of Uganda to officially launch the 100 days to Paris 2024. I thank you and I congratulate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Key stakeholders in Uganda sports industry have launched the 100 day countdown to the 2024 Olympics. Uh, there will be 19 days of competition with 206 nations taking part. 28 sports in total and there are four additional sports. I think you know some of those sports who have sports like breaking or breakdance, as some people like to, to call them, and several others that are of interest. Three 29 events in total um, with over 10,000 athletes. The French ambassador to Uganda, Javier Stick, addressed the occasion and spoke fondly of the games that returned to France 100 years after they were there. We are proud as a country. Uh, you reminded Mr. Vice, Vice President that uh, the uh, latest uh, Olympic Games in France were uh, 100 years ago in uh, 1924 uh, at a time when uh, the movies were still uh, mute <laughs> and uh, the pictures were uh, black and, and, and white. So far Uganda has uh, qualified 21 athletes over. including runners. One rower and a cyclist, plus two swimmers. On that number, we expect to add badminton, boxing and rugby that are still in qualifying. The government of Uganda has been part of the entire process of preparing these athletes ahead of their qualifiers and promises to continue. I want to call upon... The athletes now to begin putting in a lot of focus because they are the representative of the country. I know some of them have qualified, some haven't qualified. For those who haven't qualified, should continue to work hard. For those who have qualified, they should not relax, they should now work hard. As government, who have been facilitating these teams for the preparations and we will facilitate them for the main tournament. Last time out in Japan, Uganda won four medals, including two gold one silver and a bronze. Overall, Uganda has won 11 medals with only athletics and boxing responsible for that achievement. Outgoing former footballers initiative chairperson Pastor Paul Musisi has turned attention to talent search with eyes and benefiting from the football business that commands billions of shillings globally. We have more. After success in health, education and ministering, during which he mastered the art of philanthropy, Pastor Paul Musi of Caring Heart Victory Community Church at Kagula Hill has ventured into football as a business. First and foremost is to spot out, to scout uh, good players at a tender age, because we have uh, teams or players from uh, prim uh, from uh, the age of four, five, six, seven, up to under under 20. So first and foremost is spot out uh, good players who can not only win the trophy here at the school campus, but also maybe the national team can benefit out of it. 
or we can also because we want also we want to do it as a business because if you if uh, if you see what is going on in the world today one of the best uh, uh, business you can do is football this he has done through the caring heart school academy and has organized a football tournament targeting players from the age of 4 to 20 years Excellent players and teams will benefit from exposure guaranteed in countries like Spain, Germany and the United Kingdom, with Pastor Musi promising links with Nigeria for Uganda players. The Caring Heart School Academy Tournament is of six teams deliberately named after English Premier League sides Aston Villa, Arsenal, Manchester United, Manchester City, Chelsea and Liverpool. The winner of the tournament is expected to win several goodies, highlighted by the 250 US dollars. Uh, right now, I'm embarking on uh, our academy. Our Caring Heart School has a sports academy. So we are having a tournament. It's a big tournament. And uh, the winner will have a trophy, will have a, a, a prize in shillings, uh, a, a, in, in, in dollars. You can change it into Uganda shillings. So we want to see that we, we, we promote uh, the footballing uh, world in our school. And with that, UBC News Tonight has come to an end. Thank you so much for your company. We'll leave you with Kutessa Mili, who's going to give us a look at what tomorrow's weather will look like. Thanks for tuning on UBC. My name is Kutesa Milingabo with your weather update. We are still having thunder showers dominate most parts of the country. Don't forgetting we are still in the month of grasshoppers. We are moving around. You can pick one or two and enjoy at home. Going back to the weather, we are still having thunder showers dominate most parts of the country. And seeing the cellular picture, we are having the rainbow being retrieved back into our country with, together with the most winds are blowing from. Indian Ocean combination with local infects bring us the thunder showers that we are having lately. Tomorrow morning we expect to wake up to a light showers in the central part of Uganda. Moving into the eastern, we are seeing Soruti with sunny intervals, but the rest of the areas with light showers. Moving to the western stretch, morning hours with sunny intervals, most parts apart from Kasese, where we are seeing light showers. The northern sector woke up to a bright sunny day tomorrow morning. Moving to the afternoon hours, we are seeing a pickup of light showers in Nakasongola region at a maximum of 27 degrees Celsius. But the rest of the country, we are seeing a pickup of sunny intervals. Nevertheless, the temperature will remain at 27 degrees Celsius. Eastern time, we are still having a uh, highest of 30 degrees Celsius across salt and a pickup of light showers that side. Ginger and Toro is 29 at a maximum of uh, with light showers, a continuation of it in the afternoon hours. Seeing into the western sector, we are seeing a pickup of light showers. Parts of Oma Sindh with 29 in Barara and Kawala with light showers still at 27 in Barara, 24 Kawala Highlands. But we are seeing a pickup of sunny intervals in Kasese at a maximum of 30 degrees. Celsius. The northern sector, we are seeing a pickup of light showers in afternoon hours at a maximum of 30 degrees Celsius, apart from Arua, where we are seeing a uh, cloudy condition and sunny intervals and a maximum of 30 degrees Celsius. News moving out of Uganda to Rwanda, Fistis across the globe, we are forecasting sunny conditions across parts of Lagos and Dubai at a maximum of 31 degrees Celsius across Dubai and Lagos with 35 degrees Celsius. Paris with cloudy conditions, the temperature is a little bit low at 13 degrees Celsius only. Hong Kong and New York with light showers. Nevertheless, Hong Kong is pretty hot at a maximum of 30 degrees Celsius, but New York is a little low at a maximum of 13 degrees Celsius. Thanks for tuning on your BC. I remain Tessa Milinga was certain and see you tomorrow. UBC. Inspiring Uganda. Can I ask you to talk to me about your family? 
How did you meet your wife? Uh, my wife was, I met her in Chicago where I was a student in 1958, just before I left America. I, we got married in England, in London, in 1959. When I came back in 1958, 